Good morning, everybody. I'm pleased to welcome you all to this second session of this RSS special topic meeting on our local line transmission. Just a couple of housekeeping arrangements. The meeting is being recorded. And so if you do not want to be recorded, you need to, to contact Luz after the meeting. Um, also, please keep your camera off and your microphone off during the whole meeting and use the chat uh, function to, to ask questions. So this meeting um, originated um, through a discussion within the RSS COVID-19 task force about the statistical challenges of estimating local variation in the much quoted uh, national level R uh, number of the current epidemic. We've organized uh, this meeting, Peter Diggle and myself, within a very fast time frame, starting mid-February to get us to where we are today. And I'd like to thank all the authors and reviewers who have worked hard to make this possible. So this is, in a way, an experiment for the RSS, um, which we hope to, to, to make that, to repeat this experiment when there is an urgent uh, topic to be discussed that we actually can um, um, use the spirit of the discussion meetings, which have a long tradition in uh, the Royal Statistical Society, but uh, adapt uh, the framework to be a more reactive and a fast uh, response framework. So as I was saying, this is the second session. On Wednesday, we uh, heard insightful presentation and discussions um, around the relative strengths of uh, different summary statistics, uh, such as growth rates or R, which have been used to characterize the dynamic of an epidemic. We also heard some criticism of the homogeneity assumption that underlies some simplistic presentation of R by the authorities. So this morning, we're fo focusing on the central question of understanding spatial as well as temporal variation in the evolution of the epidemics. So the session will run as follows. There will be first presentation by the two authors. So Yi Wai Te will present the Te et al paper and Axel Gandhi will then present the paper by Misra and co-authors. They will have 15 minutes each. I will then call on the two invited discussants, Gavin Gibson and then Guy Nason, each of whom will speak for up to 10 minutes. We have now had notice of two contributed discussion to the follow-up discussion. So I will call on Sam Abbott and Chris Jewell, and they can speak up to five minutes. If time permits, I will ask for any additional contribution from the audience. And if you would like to, to uh, ask questions, then please use the chat. The proceedings will be published electronically under the RSS banner. And for this, each contributed discussion will need to provide us with a written version of their comments to a maximum of 400 words by Monday, the 21st of June. And I can remind you also that even if you don't contribute orally to the discussion today, you could send us their uh, comments in writing, as I said, up to a maximum of 400 words and up to Monday, the 21st of June. So Luz Martinez will be monitoring the additional questions in the chat. And as I say, I hope to have time to actually uh, be able to turn to you to ask these additional questions. But before closing the session, I will invite the authors to reply briefly uh, to the discussion, reminding them that they will be able to reply at length in the published proceedings. So I will now turn to Yiwai to present the, the first paper. And Yiwai, you've shared your screen, so the floor is yours. Thanks, Sylvia, and thanks, Peter, for organizing this very nice workshop. Um, I guess you guys can hear me? Yeah, okay. Yes. So um, I'm actually going to be 
trying to co-present this with actually three of the students that have done some of the um, simulation work uh, on this project, uh, in particular, Bob B. Her, Michael Hutchinson, and Shah Zaidi. So we'll see how that goes. So, um, uh, let me see. Okay. So, yeah. So just to kind of uh, start off, so what we're, what we're interested in is to uh, model the uh, spread and the growth of the COVID-19 epidemic across the UK, um, I guess. Um, and this here is kind of showing weekly COVID-19 cases from pillars one and two over the period of uh, September last year to, to just now, uh, June uh, of this year. And as you, uh, as you notice, um, you know, the, uh, the way um, the epidemic um, grows across the UK isn't um, homogeneous. So we see that there are kind of regional um, outbreaks. We see that the outbreaks spread across to other local authorities. And we also see that there's a dependence in the, in the way the epidemic grows or shrinks um, over time um, um, across neighboring local authorities as well as across neighboring weeks as well in, in the, in the te uh, temporal evolution. And what we'd like to do here in this project is to is to model this uh, spread and the growth of the epidemic, uh, taking into, into account these two points, which is that the epidemic spreads across um, the UK, and we believe that this is following the flow of population, people who travel to work or maybe who travel to different uh, local authorities um, in their daily lives, uh, and also to model uh, the dependence of the uh, of this evolution among the uh, uh, the neighboring local authorities as well. Okay, right. Um, so just to to set up a bit, so our the model that we developed uh, is a, a based on basically data coming from the pillars one and two of uh, daily counts of PCR swab test uh, identified COVID nineteen uh, cases, and we analyzed the data at. The, the finest spatial res resolution that we could get at the time, which is um, uh, LTLA uh, level in England, uh, unitary local authorities in Wales, and NHS regions in Scotland. I believe that nowadays there's actually kind of uh, even more finer resolution in Scotland now, but we haven't kind of made the change to the model. So this, this led us to a model over 348 uh, local areas. And we access the data through the uh, Royal Society Delft Initiative uh, COVID-19 data sets uh, software package. So the, and, the uh, and this project actually was initiated uh, when we were all part of the uh, Royal Society Delft Initiative, which was a really nice initiative uh, that was uh, chaired by the president, um, uh, Frankie Ramakrishnan, uh, last year. Right, so, and I've kind of talked about this. So, so what we'd like to do is to model the um, spread and the growth of the uh, COVID-19 epidemic across local authorities in the UK. Um, and we would like to do this with the aims of monitoring this growth um, and to, to perform short-term forecasting as well as now casting of, of what might happen to the epidemic in the next three, a few weeks. And, and also to identify potential hotspots as well. And this could be useful in terms of uh, the government and local health authorities uh, monitoring the situation. Um, and uh, we, of course, you know, with a lot of statistical models, we make various modeling assumptions. And I think the biggest one is probably we're going to assume that there's a direct correlation between the reported case counts and the true infection counts. So it's not that there's a direct one-to-one -one correspondence, but rather there's kind of a a strong correlation across the two, so that uh, growth or shrinkage in the in the number of cases does correspond to growth or shrinkage in the in the in the true curve um, infections. Uh, this is of course a very strong assumption, um, but uh, we believe that um, uh, since September, when uh, the the UK testing capacity has been uh, increased significantly. This is not such a big problem now. Okay. Right. So, and the approach that we take is a renewal uh, process-based approach. Um, of course, this is based on on lots of very nice work uh, by Corey et al., Flexman et al., and also Samir Bhatt et al. also wrote a, a very nice uh, discussion of this approach. 
So the idea here is that we're going to model the number of infections uh, across each local authority indexed by I and across different days of the of the uh, of the epidemic in, uh, indexed by T. And we're going to model this as a renewal process. So XIT is a uh, condition on the past is going to be a uh, uh, random, so it's going to be stochastic, it's going to be negative binomially distributed with the mean given by this quantity and some uh, dispersion parameter that uh, that describes how, um, how over dispersed this process is. So this could be important in terms of super spreading um, events that could happen as well as search testing. And the mean here is basically uh, uh, given by the uh, instantaneous uh, reproduction number for the local authority, I and day T, um, times uh, something which uh, we can refer to as an infection load, uh, which is basically a convolution between the counts of the number of infections in the past with uh, WS here is uh, basically is the, it corresponds to the generation interval distribution. It's the probability that a secondary infection occurs as days after a primary infection um, happens. So this describes the latent um, process in which infections uh, grow um, in this particular uh, local authority. And the observed number of uh, pillars one and two positive test counts, so CIT, is then further modeled as a, as a negative binomially distributed a quantity uh, uh, given by uh, with a mean given by basically uh, a convolution between the infection counts and the uh, and a delay distribution. So this delay distribution is basically modeling uh, if somebody is infected on some day that they would actually get tested uh, as days in the future. Um, and we also model, uh, there's a kind of a day of week variation. We can see this uh, weekly variation going up and down. Um, and we, we modeled that as well. Okay. And uh, again, we use a negative binomial with some uh, over dispersion parameter, uh, phi i. Okay. So this is uh, the basic of, um, of the renewal uh, process approach. And on top of this, I think the, uh, the two um, uh, improved um, additions to this model that we worked on is basically a metapopulation model which models how infections spread from one local authority to another as well as a, a latent Gaussian process which kind of smooths the, uh, 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 the uh, estimates of our reproduction numbers. Right. So the metapopulation model that we that we work with is uh, basically is, is pretty simple. We basically say that the uh, mean of the um, I'm sorry, I seem to be hearing a keyboard. Uh, um, might be too. Uh, okay. So uh, we as we assume that the mean for the number of infections um, on each day. Is going to be the reproduction. Can you please make sure you are muted, everybody, because we do hear a keyboard. Thank yeah. you. Uh, yep. So the mean for the number of infections happening on each day for local authority I is going to be the instantaneous reproduction number as before times um, actually uh, an average of the infection loads averaged by this F uh, matrix here, which you could think of as. Uh, um, uh, as a um, flux, um, well, I, actually, is as related as as basically uh, modeling the probability that an infection, a primary infection that happened in local authority J, spreads to a local authority I. Okay, and we model this in a very simple way, uh, partly because we don't have access to real time. Uh, true kind of travel patterns across the UK. Uh, so what we did was to use um, uh, to the 2011 UK census uh, data about commuter flows, and we modeled um, the the F matrix as follows. It's basically um, 
alpha T, which controls the the amount of travel across uh, different uh, local authorities. You can think of this as corresponding to the the amount of the population that is working from home, say. Uh, so alpha T times delta J I. So this is uh, equal to one if um, uh, J equals to I and equals to zero if it's not equal to I. And then uh, one minus alpha T times uh, the convex combination between two, um, two, uh, two matrices. Uh, we call this the forward matrix and the reverse matrix. And the forward matrix is basically uh, uh, modeling the probability that a resident of area I who works in area, uh, sorry, a resident of area J who works in area I infects a resident of area I. Okay, so in fact, somebody at the workplace. Okay? Well, the reverse probability is uh, goes the other way around. Is is the uh, uh, it models the probability that a resident of area J infects a resident of area I who comes to area J to work. Okay, so this is kind of modeling. Uh, basically, the flow of the population across I to J and FJI is modeling how that flow uh, turns into uh, the chance that uh, an infection in, in area J could lead to an infection in area I. Um, and the forward and the reverse matrices are computed from the um, UK 2011 census, while the alphas and parameters and the and the beta parameters are, are inferred as part of the model as well. Um, and then finally, for the second part, uh, we, uh, we use a spatial temporal latent uh, Gaussian process to kind of capture the a priori dependence among the, R, among the uh, instantaneous reproduction numbers. And the idea here is that we would like to use this to smooth both spatially and temporally our estimates of, of, our, of the uh, uh, of the reproduction numbers. And here we use, um, uh, uh, basically we model this uh, uh, reproduction number as exponential of the sum of two um, Gaussian processes. The first one is a spatial temporal Matin uh, kernel, uh, is a, a Matin Gaussian process with a kernel given as follows. And the U's here are basically for each local authority I, it's a, it's a Matin 1 2 uh, Gaussian process, uh, which corresponds to an AR1 process, uh, which basically models the temporal correlations of the, R, of the RTs for that local authority. Okay. So that kind of like is a high level description of the, of the model. Um, in terms of implementation and comp computations, um, we basically implemented this in R stand, which is a really nice uh, probabilistic programming system. And there uh, were a number of ways that we uh, uh, implemented uh, in terms of to improve the computational efficiency and the mixing speed of our model. Uh, in particular, we used a uh, we chose a chronic structure for the GP kernel, and there's some really nice tricks that computational tricks that you could do to to speed up the computation uh, by Yunus Sachi and Seth Flaxman, who is here, I think. Uh, we also uh, made a continuous approximation for the negative binomial infection model. Um, and another thing that we did was to kind of, instead of simulating the posterior for the whole model across the whole of, uh, of the UK, we actually just simulated this for each region only. Okay. So that uh, concludes the, um, the, the, um, uh, the description of the model and the computation, and would like to kind of uh, uh, present some uh, simulation results. Uh, you you have two sorry, you have two minutes, please. Okay, okay. Michael. Um, yeah. So this first experiment is a sanity check of our model, um, and what we did is we fit the model to data generated from the the forward model uh, that we're doing inference with. Um, we use five regions, and as the basis of that, use the five regions surrounding Oxford, the five LTLAs surrounding Oxford, uh, and use sort of parameters from the flux matrices uh, and things like this uh, in order to, to sort of uh, make these regions. Um, the initial simulations were kicked off with real data from the start of the epidemic, and then the rest of the simulation uses an RT curve we fit to give this sort of double peak epidemic um, with case numbers sort of roughly on the same order as we saw in, in real life. 
Um, that choice is kind of arbitrary, but the, um, it sort of gives us an example to fit this model to where we know the underlying RT. Um, so we fit our model as well as FE estim and FE now to this data. Uh, and the plot you can see on the right here is for just one of the regions, the uh, recovery of the positive test cases distribution and the RT distribution um, through time. Um, what we can see is FE estim uh, does a, an okay job, but the, the estimates going across different weeks are quite noisy and jump quite a lot. Um, and sometimes the uh, underlying RT doesn't fit inside the, the confidence bounds of, of the estimate. You can also see the estimates are shifted by about a week, and that's because uh, the FE estim model uh, assumes the report date of a case is the same as the infection date. Um, but you can correct this by subtracting sort of mean time to uh, report after infection uh, from that distribution and it'll, and it'll shift backwards. Um, Epi now two, uh, it looks like it produces slightly over smoothed estimates of the um, RT inferred. Uh, but we have since sort of publishing this paper been in contact with the authors of the Epi now two package and um, there are some perhaps issues with the way we apply that model. So the, the results for this may change. Um, you can see that the EpiMap models um, both recover the underlying RT well, um, and the single area model has no spatial correlation. The second model, the, the in green, um, has a 10 kilometer spatial uh, correlation, and it sort of recovers the RT parameter with a slightly uh, higher confidence bound, or sort of smaller confidence bound. Um, and hopefully that would also shrink if we included more than five regions uh, in this estimate or in the, the simulation. Um, it's perhaps unsurprising that our EpiMap models um, recover the data best since we're sort of fitting a model to the, the, the generative model is the same as the inference model. Um, and so additional tests where we uh, use a less well-specified model for the data generation would be interesting to pursue. Uh, and I'll let Shah talk about his stuff next. I think you really need to wrap up in, in one minute now. Okay, um, I'm, I'm just going to quickly give the main main takeaway for this. Um, in this next study, we just looked at how well these models um, forecast future case counts. Um, so we looked at two things essentially. One is their predictive performance, just how well they get the true case counts right. And that's in the upper plot. In the lower plot, we're looking at uncertainty estimation. So just recall that each of these models produces a posterior predictive distribution over the case counts. And we basically look at how well calibrated that is in terms of uncertainty. Um, the key takeaways here are that we did an ablation where we took our, mod our model, by the way, is called EpiMap here. So EpiMap at the single area is one which does not have any cross area dependencies. And then the spatial, mo no spatial model is one in which the GP does not have a spatial component. And then the remaining models are kind of the full model. Um, and the key takeaway here really is that um, having this cross area dependency is quite useful and generally that helps the forecasts. Um, a few other things um, to just note over here is that there are certain um, time periods where there's a sudden change in NPIs, for example, the third date shown over here. Um, and when you have a big change in the NPIs, and this is not taken into account by the models, they, for example, would predict um, exponential growth, um, but that wouldn't actually happen. And in, in some sense, they tend to overshoot. Um, and just quickly on the uncertainty estimation, generally, we found EpiMap's uh, posterior predictive to be quite well calibrated with respect to the true counts. Um, but there is some variation across uh, model configurations and dates, and, and I'm happy to talk about that a bit more during the discussion period. I'll just pass on to, uh, I think, EY or Bobby. Um, I think I we think just get through this. Um, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. Should we just skip through and finish on the discussion? Is that yes. okay? Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, um, so, sorry, Bobby. Uh, perhaps we have time to uh, look back uh, later. So, um, yeah. So, I, I guess that's you know quite a number of uh, uh, things to discuss. So, there are of course limitations due to, due to the provenance of this uh, case count data that we base our model around, and and definitely there are ways of improving this by kind of, uh, combining this with other sources of more unbiased forms of data. Um, there are a number of issues around uh, model misspecification. We find that the model is not very well specified with respect to the spatial length scale and with respect to the generation interval and incubation period distributions. And for, for all of this, we had to fix this um, using either cross-validation or using uh, cut models. There's a complex interplay um, among the kind of stochasticity across the three layers of the model. And I think that there's quite a lot of work to be done in terms of analyzing uh, the effect of, of this uh, complex, each component of, of this uh, complex model. And there are a number of future directions, but I'd like to end with thanking uh, the reviewers, the organizers, Sylvia and Peter, and you guys, and as well as 
various folks from the Royal Society Delft Initiative who have helped as well as uh, Barry Rowlinson and Chris Jewell who provided some data to us as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, UI team. Sorry to, to have to be a, a chef chair. Um, can you stop sharing your screen and then um, I will hand over the floor to Axel Gandhi, who will present uh, the paper by Misra and Corses. Right, so thank you all very much. Um, thank you for this interesting presentation preceding mine. And thank you to Sylvia and Peter for organizing things. So this is basically a model we've, which we've been running for some time already for the last nine months. It's been a whole lot of people involved in this one. So thanks to Swapnil, James, Daniel, Harrison, Neil, Samir, Seth for making this possible. So what is the model about? Well, it's an, a model for the COVID-19 epidemic at a local authority level. It's part of a general modeling effort we've been doing for semi-mechanistic models, which started basically roughly in uh, March 2020. Uh, we have an implementation of this kind of framework in an R package called Epidemia. And this R package is based on RSTAN and RSTAN ARM. It's a relatively new version. It's literally, I think, going on the GitHub today or has, has just gone on the GitHub. Some innovations in this local model compared to previous things we've been doing. We're doing a random walk modeling for the reproduction number. We take information from different sources, cases, death, and survey data. We also model the infections as latent random variables. One thing which we hope we didn't have to do is, but what we ended up doing is we have been updating the model or the results from the model. I wouldn't say quite daily, but almost daily since September 2020. Um, we've learned a lot of uh, things that can go wrong in the process in terms of data pipelines breaking, as you can imagine. If I have time later, I'll say a bit more about that. Um, the model has been used for, well, what is it useful? You can use it for now casting, you can use it for short-term projections, or estimating historical trends. Some of the results feed into the COVID response. Particularly, Scotland has been using our data for quite some time, or in our data, our model outputs. Okay, so what is the data? We use publicly available data in this case. Um, as states for cases, just as a specific thing, we use the specimen collection date. We use case and death counts and survey data. And one thing to account for this day of the week effect, we literally just aggregate these counts for every week. The aggregation may shift what a, means, what a week means, shifts basically by which day our projection is issued on. We work at the local authority level because that was basically the lowest you could go when this everything started. So in England, that means lower tier local authorities. Now for the model, as I said, this is similar. It's probably this is similar to what you've seen just before. It's a renewal equation behind this one. So let me just give you the basic idea and then more detail later on. So these are the infections in a region at time t. And that's based on previous infections. So this is basically previous infections running over previous time points, multiplied by some weighting, some generation distribution. And that then gets then multiplied by the instantaneous reproduction number. So this is this RT here. Now, a lot of the modeling happens within this RT. So what we specifically do is we will assume that this RT is a weekly random walk. That's the main idea. On the top right, for example, you see the current estimate for one region and in this or one local authority. In this local authority, you will have seen there's been quite a steep increase recently in the estimate, but it's coming down again. At least it seems to be coming down. Now, a little bit more. In this uh, particular model, we have this infection and on top of these infections, we then have different types of observations. So the O are the observations and the L here at the very top that in indicates the observation type. And these observations follow some distribution. So these distributions can be negative binomial, which we you mostly use for cases and death, or with a normal distribution for some estimated zero prevalence. And these, but overall these observations are then gathered around a, an estimated mean, and that mean is then 
as the infections based on previous infections. So the mean observations are previous infections weighted to allow for time delays in some way and then multiplied by some additional factor, ascertainment rates. Basically, basically how many infections or how many cases would you expect per infection or how many weekly cases you would expect. Now, what we'll do is in our model, we actually estimate these alphas. We have, at the moment, dependence between regions is mainly coming in through prior, so basically a staged fit of the models. But if you wanted to have a proper joint model, you would basically do this via modeling the alpha and T and the RT, basically they sharing common parts. Top right, what you see is just one fit of the weekly cases per 100,000, again, for the same area. And what you see here is, well, the, uh, brown ones or the red ones are the observed values and the lines are what the model is fitting to and what it's now predicting or projecting forwards. Now that's the basic setup, uh, but we've had to have two more additions on this one. One thing is that we allow the infections to be randoms. So the infections actually follow a log normal distribution in this model around the mean number of infections from the past. So that's basically the renewal equation from the previous slide. But we're saying there's a little bit of noise around this one. That's number one. And the number two is we have some adjustment in there so that we don't, well, that we account at least a little bit for the number of people that are no longer susceptible. So what this one is doing is Maybe it's easiest if I try to explain it down here. It's saying we have this basic number of infections, but then this gets multiplied by a factor. And that factor is saying it's one minus. And what you have here is the infections up to this point in time divided by N, the population size. So if half of the people have already been infected, this would just be get multiplied by a factor of 0 0.5. Now, you will notice there's a lot of things here on the slide about doing it in continuous time. This is simply to make sure that we're not overshooting the population. So if you have very large projected increases in these small areas, you can overshoot the population size quite quickly to make sure that this is not going to happen. Essentially, this overshooting happens through this criticization effects. We use basically a differential equation, which we solve to get basically a formula that says infections at time t is based on these it prime. I didn't say it what the it prime is. The it prime was the infections that you would have if everyone was susceptible. So basically, we first work out how many individuals would be susceptible, and then we basically adjust for the susceptible a little bit. I should add that in our software package in this epidemia, we now have versions for putting in vaccination, but that's currently not in this local area model. Whenever I talk about reproduction numbers in any results, it will be basically the reproduction number adjusted for the susceptible population. So it's literally more or less how much does the IT increase. Okay, so how does everything fit together? Now, we use a three-stage approach. This is partially for computational reasons, because we literally have fitted these models on a regular basis. Uh, so the first stage is we first basically fit it to, in this case, to, I think, England as a whole, to estimate what we've said, the IFR and IAR. So that's basically the, this is the infection fatality ratio. That's the proportion of infections leading to a fatality and infection ascertainment rate that's the proportion of infections leading to a reported case. So basically the first model is essentially used to estimate these two over time as time varying variables. Uh, second stage, we then do some individual models for the devolved nations and the nine regions of England to get an overall estimate of what the reproduction number is in these regions, which then gets fed into the individual models essentially through a covariate and with a prior around it. Now, just to give you a little bit of an overview of what kind of model we are using or of this first stage, so it's probably useful just to talk through what kind of information goes in there. So we have 
we're modeling the infections. These are latent infections. And in that one goes, well, a time varying reproduction number. We to have that one, we need to have some initial value, some st starting it out, some random walk, in this case for England. The infections have noise included with it. And of course, to basically get new infections, we need the generation distribution, which is something if you assume from external data. Now, conditional on these model infections, now we basically get various observations, reported deaths, reported cases, and other survey data. And basically, all of this reported, uh, reported information is literally just a weighted sum of the infections with appropriate factors coming to play. Taking into account time delays, so this is basically, for example, the symptoms to death distribution, infections to symptoms distribution, time between infections and cases, and the, and now basically we also have estimates of the IFR and the IAR that is going to go into play here. So that basically is, is saying that there's a lot of pieces to this puzzle. On top, you see some plots of what these estimates of the infection fatality rate and the infection ascertainment ratio is. So you see it's not been completely constant over time, not surprisingly. Results. Uh, I should give thanks to Fabian Walker, who is basically helping us setting up the website uh, link. So please go to this link, have a look, and look at your uh, your local regions if you're interested in. We've updated, updated the results since September 2021. Um, as I said, lots of lessons and things that can go wrong. For example, sometimes the names of the regions changed. All of a sudden, there was a hyphen in the names, which wasn't there before. And you can imagine timing updates not happening at the right times, which we relied on. Lots of fun things. Uh, we have maps and tables and results for individual areas. To give you a bit of an idea of the kind of maps that we have in here, for example, we deliberately show a map of epidemic growth. So this is not directly a plot of the reproduction number, it's a plot of the probability of the reproduction number being bigger than one or being less than one. So if essentially, if it's purple, it's bigger than one. If, if it's green, it's less than one. And if it's white, the model that is not sure where it's going. And you can see basically, for example, if we look in December 2020, the model thinks the entire South south of uh, the UK is essentially going up uh, after the lockdown just after Christmas all of a sudden the picture has changed it's coming down again that was basically the picture by the time we finished our this, this particular paper and today I've just plugged in basically very small what the what the thing about the situations like that it's turned far more red again so the idea of this color scheme was basically to say we we wanted to basically show which areas are going up or going down. That was the main focus of that. Another bit we did is we basically do projections up to two weeks into the future. And for that, we basically have maps again of exceedance probabilities. We're not completely confident that our model will, if our model predicts very high, exceed, very high increases, these may or may not happen due to intervention, all sorts of other reasons, but we're probably more confident in projecting a probability of things going above a certain threshold. So for example, that map here on the right gives you the probability of uh, the cases exceeding 500 cases per 100,000 population in a given week. That was just before, uh, there was just projection on Christmas for well, essentially the week thereafter. Now, model evaluation. This is a bit of a tricky one, model evaluation with this model, because one thing we don't do, we don't try to actively model interventions, behavior changes, and so on. So Two basically, minutes, um, yeah, excellent. That's great. So the basically what you see is, for example, just before Christmas, the model has been basically, the, the, if you look at X is the observed cases or the projected cases, Y is the observed number of cases and you see here the model is slightly um, under predicting because there was the new variant coming in and then during the lockdown it was slightly uh, over predicting again there was the lockdown coming in the model needed some time to adjust for that it probably takes one or two weeks to adjust for that 
So um, as with any model, we've got lots of limitations in there. Um, let me pick out one thing. We are not doing a fully joint model. So that's probably different to the previous model. Part of the reason is computation. Another reason is that we deliberately wanted model projections to be not that strongly affected by neighboring areas. So that basically, if you see an area to be projected as increasing, it is mostly down to that area. One example where if you look at the current projection, there's clearly an outlier between other areas is the situation Bolton. It seems to be one area where it's going down and a sea of everything, where again, areas going up. Now, what other bits in there? Um, we uh, have, yeah, basically what we do is, and I think that's similar to the previous model, we have our time varying covariates to be depending on the current time and not on the infection time that basically allows the model to react to changes affecting all currently infected individuals. Now on to the uh, last slide. So that was a model for epidemic and local authorities. We used information from higher levels basically to get some priors for the lower levels. We updated the re results regularly. We have a Bayesian model implementation using our R basically based on our R package. And I should probably highlight if you want to try something similar yourself, this particular reference here, it's basically a sm small vignette telling you how to fit models to different data. Some model code is available at this link. And I should basically give big thanks to everyone that helped making this happen, including the entire Imperial College COVID-19 response team. And of course, we were, I was also part of the Delft initiative, initiative as well. So some of these thoughts were coming also from these areas. So thank you all very much. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Axel. Thank you very much for the, the presentation and, and, and the summary. Um, yes, I think we're all looking forward to the discussion. And so I will now invite uh, Gavin to share his uh, screen. So could you please stop sharing, Axel? Yes, thank you. Gavin Gibson will be the first invited discussion for both papers. Gavin, are you? I should be unmuted now. Um, yes, can, can you see my screen? Unfortunately, I can no longer see my own screen. So yes, yeah, we could see your screen. Thank you I'm very much. I'm going to uh, share it again. No, it's fine. We were seeing it. I, I can see it. Oh, yeah, but you can. <laughs> yeah. OK, uh, thank you very much to Peter and Sylvia for the opportunity to discuss these papers. I just want to start by congratulating the authors uh, of both of these papers for their very um, stimulating presentations and papers. Uh, to be able to turn around quantitative analysis like these um, during a, um, a, a pandemic in, in real time um, is certainly no mean feat. And I realize the pressure that uh, um, both groups and indeed all the other groups have been working under um, and they're to be congratulated for that. Um, I'm going, my comments really are split into three parts. I'll make some general comments about the, the approach taken by the authors for both of these papers, and then perhaps discuss a little bit some of the immediate questions that um, the, the, these point to, and uh, hopefully have time to end up with one or two general challenges, which I think uh, emerges um, out of the, all the, the modeling effort uh, looking at the pandemic. So I'll just say a little bit about the kinds of uh, a sec. There we go. Great. So um, just a, a, some general comments about the approach. I think both of these papers illustrate the approach that is taken when the main drivers is to be able to, to estimate R. And uh, if you want to be able to estimate R, the most natural way to try to do it is to propose a model where you have a um, R as an intrinsic parameter in this kind of hierarchical way, um, where your infection process is then driven by the R process. Um, uh, in both papers, the infection process looks like some kind of autoregressive 
process with coefficients coming from the generation time um, distribution, um, where R is playing the role of a gain, and then we have an observation process that would be would give us our, our cases or, or, or deaths or, or, or whatever one is observing. And this is a very kind of natural um, way to approach things. Um, but I think some questions that I'll discuss will will arise out of that. Now it is as as both uh, authors have noted um, in their prior model for for the R process, which is a key thing, um, there isn't really um, any kind of direct reflection of um, the impact of interventions, vaccination or, or uh, susceptible depletion necessarily. Um, other aspects of the, this, this modeling process is that uh, the detection process um, is the, the, a mechanism is not built whereby the, the detection process would impact on R. So in other words, if you're able to detect the disease much more effectively, that doesn't necessarily feed back to um, limit the ability of the, the, the disease to spread. But nevertheless, um, this is a very natural way to approach things. But I kind of see this as almost a kind of signal processing take on epidemic modeling or an image analysis take, where the goal is to recover, if you like, this true image here, which is the R process from this kind of, um, if you like, filtered, noisy version of it. So both papers are taking that approach, but there are some key differences in approach which are, are worth pointing out. Certainly the way in which geographical coupling is included um, is, is different between the two papers. Um, the spatiotemporal Gaussian process is, is used in the Tate paper. Um, Mishra et al. are using a kind of more inherited approach where um, uh, analysis at uh, large scale filter through to ana analysis at the, the smaller scale. Again, there's the, a, a difference in approach between the way in which in the, the correspondence between infections are treated. Um, certainly um, in, in the Tate paper, um, this close correspondence is, is assumed. Um, certainly the way in which the, the, the latent infection process and the interpretation of RT um, is slightly different between the two papers. Um, in the Mishra paper, the RT um, is, uh, or basically the prior for the RT is very much more in terms of a raw RT and then it is a, an adjusted RT which is uh, reported. And certainly the papers are different in terms of their um, utilisation of data sources and the emphasis in the predictive um, analysis that, that, that they do and the comparative analysis. Analysis. But some general questions which I think do emerge from this, and this is not meant to be a, a criticism of the um, of the authors because I realise the limited of time that they have to uh, to do this. So um, this is very much kind of the next steps, and in fact it's already been alluded to that one I think very important issue is the kind of interplay between the assumptions that one makes at different levels in this hierarchy. So uh, an interesting question is, uh, what's the interplay between, for example, the priors that one puts on the dispersion parameters for the observations and the inferences that one make about uh, RT? So it's certainly intuitive that uh, if one put a very strong prior that there's going to be a lot of dispersion in the observations, this may then mean that uh, um, one gets less information about the, the RT process and one would expect to see that kind of sensitivity. Similarly, um, not having um, a direct incorporation of the impact of interventions, I think, has some implications. So, for example, um, in neither model is there any representation of the impact of um, uh, an intervention. That would then mean that uh, if one does impute that there is a, a very sharp large change in RT, that then has to be attributed to the volatility that one has in the Gaussian process or the random walk process. And then that naturally is going to feed through to predictions. So I think there's certainly a sensitivity analysis that would be really interesting to, to see there about how um, including, um, for example, a model which can incorporate step changes in RT, um, the differences that one might get when one looks at predictive distributions. Um, again, the the the, the, the the correspondence between cases and infections. Um, it's not clear to me that uh, generation time um, interval distribution should be the same for a, an observed case and for an asymptomatic um, infection. And again, it would be interesting to see um, what happens if one attempts to build in more of that kind of complexity. Where I think it, uh, perhaps more could, could have been done is in the, the field of uh, model assessment. Um, in the Mishra paper, um, we saw the, the, the uh, weekly median projections against the observed case numbers. 
Um, actually, given that these are on a log scale, it seemed to me that there's actually a substantial discrepancy there. Um, um, the YK um, paper is looking much more at um, a, a range of measures based on mean square errors. And this idea of the ability to recover RT from data simulated from the model. Now, I think perhaps um, the, the authors could have set themselves a, a slightly tougher uh, benchmark um, because it would be interesting to see how the predictive power of these models compared to simpler smoothing approaches um, such as would be used by my colleagues um, in, in the actuarial department that I'm in um, when they come to do things like mortality projections. Um, and another very interesting test I think that would be useful is what insights are offered by um, these techniques when you come to look at data that's being, that comes from a more complex model. And in, in his discussion on Wednesday, so John Kingman spoke about um, the idea of the R matrix, um, where one has a structured population with uh, differential mixing between um, groups within that population. And again, I think a potentially very interesting analysis would be to do for, for, for the authors of these papers today would be to actually generate data that comes from a structured population with some um, R matrix RIJT. You can still simulate analogous data to that that's, that's analyzed in these papers, but then to look, for example, at the correspondence between an inferred univariate RT and the maximal eigenvalue of a time varying matrix. I think that would be a really interesting thing to do to see potentially what biases one might get when one, when one looks at a more um, structured population. Um, the last part, I just want to highlight one or two challenges. And at this point, I should put up my hand and say that actually I've done very little um, when it comes to modeling pandemics at this kind of scale. Most of my epidemic work has looked at uh, diseases, for example, in populations of uh, plants or trees. And there, I think a rather different approach is, is taken to the modeling because um, often the same kinds of models are very relevant. But rather than, for example, parameterize a model in terms of uh, RT, one tends to parameterize models in terms of the parameters that you feel represent the important mechanisms. Um, you generally take a, a more explicit account of uh, control strategies, and uh, you're much more interested in focusing on predictive distributions under uh, putative control strategies. Where R can be defined, um, and it's not always the case that you would want to do that, but it is rather a byproduct of the assumptions that you make rather than an intrinsic parameter in the depths of the, uh, um, of the uh, uh, hierarchy. So that's a rather different kind of setting. Now, this is only possible in the areas that I work in because the populations are sufficiently well understood and the data is sufficiently rich that you can do the inference. And clearly, for a disease like COVID, a mechanistic approach such, that, uh, such as the one taken by Ferguson and colleagues in the, the key paper that motivated the first uh, lockdown, um, these are very detailed models that have very complicated mixing patterns. Uh, and at the same time, the, the data that people are working with um, is often very, very uh, crude in comparison to the complexity of the system. So I think there is a general uh, challenge as we go forward is to how is it possible perhaps to better align data sources and provision um, with the need to be able to, to uh, inform more mechanistic models. We heard a lot on uh, um, Wednesday uh, about you know, whether R was useful or not, um, different, different views there. Apologies to Edwin Starr for, uh, for this slide, um, but R, what is it good for? I personally do feel that um, being able to impute trajectories of, of, of R is actually very useful. It's a useful summary statistic that can give you some idea as to how effective post hoc uh, an intervention may have been in that it does relate things directly to, um, if you like, the transmissibility of a disease. I also think that um, R, the focus on R, has perhaps been useful in promoting within the public uh, a general understanding of epidemic dynamics and making, making people realize and appreciate that a small change in behavior can lead to a catastrophic change in the dynamics of a, an epidemic. Clearly, um, it's not so good if one wants to make inferences about um, uh, targeted control strategies or get a fine scale understanding. But the two papers that we've seen today, I think it would be really useful to see, for example, how these approaches could be generalized, for example, to look at inference of a time varying R matrix 
um, as opposed to univariate R. And I think um, there's, uh, I think, uh, you know, this, this, the authors have really provided, um, I think, a very useful groundwork for exciting developments like that in the future. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Kathleen, for your very uh, comprehensive remarks, you know, com compare and contrast and, and, and so on, and, and your uh, comments about uh, the need to align more data capture, which resounds uh, very much with, with all of us, I think. Uh, can I now hand the floor to, to Guy? Guy Nixon from Imperial. Yeah, sure. Um, I think Gavin needs to stop sharing. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's there. a prerequisite, Gavin. Okay. The technology, and I'll mute my. Okay. All right, Sylvia. Can you see that? Uh, it's just my, my not quite good, yet. No. Looks good for me, guy. Okay, so uh, thank yes. you very much. Uh, thanks, Sylvia. Thanks uh, very much to the organisers. Um, uh, for inviting me to discuss both of these papers. Uh, I'm Guy Nason from Imperial College. Um, I just wanted to put in a quick disclaimer. It's clearly I'm in the same institution as the authors of the Mishra article, and I've had a very minor authorship role on another recently submitted paper with them. Uh, indeed, I'm in the same department as three of them, um, but I haven't talked to them about this, and I did not contribute at all to the review of their article. I just wanted to make this clear. I will, however, discuss both articles, but at least you now have full disclosure. Um, so opening comments. I loved our, both articles very much indeed. Uh, in fact, all the meeting contributions. So thanks to the organisers for organising this. I think it's really fantastic um, for these authors and of course the wider statistical community, a lot of um, names being mentioned this morning, to have done so much uh, in support of the, the pandemic effort and actually also probably um, with not huge amounts of resources as well. And these two articles in particular I think are outstanding examples of what can be done, not just for some excellent statistical modelling, but importantly communicating key quantities of interest to the wider public and getting it out there. And, you know, I urge you to go and look at the uh, excellent websites that these articles um, have generated um, that graphically present the results of their analysis. And you can have hours of um, uh, amusement um, looking at these websites and changing things and playing around with them. However, for this discussion contribution, I feel a little bit like the Twitter why guy. So the person who comes up after all the discussions been going on saying, well, why did you do this? Why did you do that? I don't understand this. Um, so that's uh, my role here today. Um, so here is a snapshot from um, the Mishra at our front page of their website. This is uh, pretty recent for the 6th of June. This is the hotspot plot. Obviously, it does other things as well. Uh, and you can see um, the northwest of uh, England uh, bubbling up there. Um, I won't go into the details of exactly what it's showing. It's basically um, a color is bad and, and, and not color is, is um, uh, OK. Um, and here's the um, te front page of their website uh, for a particular date and time. Um, again, you can see the UK map with the local authorities. Um, and I'm just going to pick on one of the local authorities, this one here, Flintshire, which is just in the northwest um, area, um, it, kind of in North Wales. Um, and what I want you to focus on is um, for uh, this, this same set of dates. This is the estimated RT down in the bottom right hand corner from their model. And you can see uh, up to, uh, I think, uh, that, that date in June, 6th of June. Um, before that, you've got the kind of uh, the estimate of RT. And then after that is the projection. And you can see the projection going towards the end of July goes to about two. That's the median there. If I try and do the same thing um, after I've clicked on a certain part of the Mishra website, um, I think this is the equivalent um, uh, RT estimated plot from there. Uh, and what I find interesting about this is that the two median on the previous um, plot isn't actually on this um, plot at all. So um, are there discrepancies between these two systems, these two models? Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, the RT estimates are really not the same. I mean, it's possible I've got the date slightly different. The data is just a little bit uh, out, but I think I'm pretty, pretty uh, close. Um, and in particular, in this particular example, uh, the end of July median prediction of TER is outside the 90% confidence interval of Mishra et al. So, of course, these two things, the outcomes, do not have to be the same, of course. They're different models. 
Um, but perhaps I think this is not a good look for the general public, or at least needs a lot more explaining. Um, and to be fair, some other regions are much more similar. Uh, I just really looked around for one that was quite different. Now, of course, you may say, well, that's just a cheap shot. You know, <laughs> could have done that for any kinds of um, comparing two different models for various things. Uh, but I think there is a serious point here. In my question is that how much model uncertainty is really incorporated in each of these articles? Yeah. The case plots, of course, look more similar, uh, although uh, hard to compare as one's a line plot, the other's a bar plot, different vertical scales and so on. The input data sources, uh, I think, are very similar, if not identical. Um, so really, the differences are not so much a technical point. We know the models are different. We know they're doing slightly different things, but it's really one of communications, visualization and um, getting across to the public. You know, if they see these two things and they're showing very different answers, then the public's going to wonder about the credibility, perhaps. The articles stem from a common root. Um, and as, as George says, they have developed differently. So um, they both uh, base themselves, I guess, on the Flaxman 2020 nature paper. Uh, Ter has this nice uh, incorporating dependencies between reproduction numbers across the neighboring localities, this share strength across localities and time. Although it was interesting that uh, Axel mentioned that actually they wanted to kind of get away from that and look at individual regions uh, on their own merits. And also uh, the tear paper has this very nice spatial meta population model, which incorporates uh, the 2011 UK census computer, computer flow data. Mishra et al, well, they have case counts as well as deaths. Um, they also incorporate prevalence survey data, which are obviously very important, and introduce a number of time varying concepts, such as the infection ascertainment rate. Again, all worthwhile advances, and it's just great to see this developing um, all the time. What they don't seem to have, as far as I can tell, um, and this has been mentioned previously, is modelling of the non-pharmaceutical intervention. So things like lockdown, for example. And that's you know freely admitted by both authors in their papers, um, but I still think it's a big thing. Of course, the results of these things will feed through eventually, but when and how? I mean, it must be a way of trying to figure out at least that rather than, you know, if you're not going to model it, do you know how it's going to feed through and what's the effect going to be? And also um, direct modelling of pharmaceutical inventions such as vaccines, although perhaps it does in enter indirectly through other means, um, for example, in the Mishra work, at least the more recent stuff, certainly through the priors. However, I would have really liked to have seen more information coming from uh, other mobility and stringency data, priors slash covariates. For example, Google Mobility has quite low level data on mobility, and I've been using that in some other work uh, on, on uh, various predictions. So it seems a little bit odd to me that a vast amount of care is being given on the kind of details of the models, uh, the different sets of priors, but actually they miss out, in my view, some of the strongest, most identifiable pieces of prior information. In terms of modelling, I think both articles have explained their modelling choices really well. Personally, I'm not a great fan of the weekly jump RT choice. I can kind of see why it's done. It kind of goes with the data and kind of what it's doing. Um, there's the issue of whether the data directly tells you much about the finer than weekly resolution. I think it does, even from weekly observations. And, you know, given the likely underlying smooth mechanistic model and away from the jumps caused by MPIs, I think smooth representations might have done a better job. For example, using some kind of Bayesian non-parametric representation using Fourier splines or, in my view, even better wavelets for which Bayesian methods really do make a lot of sense. Uh, and I think also if this was employed, then the parameterization might have been even simpler. Just as a general point, uh, and I think I say this a lot, I thought there were a lot of um, uninformative priors throughout both sets of work. Uh, model evaluation has already been mentioned, and I have to strongly agree uh, to that. I think both articles do this, uh, Mishra, to a, a, a limited extent. Um, and tear much more, but I think much more could be done. A figure five, which we've already seen, showed median projections of cases versus observed weekly case numbers. And the conclusion in the paper is that they show a reasonable correspondence. And I thought reasonable was doing a lot of heavy lifting in that sentence. So it's already been pointed out that December and January 
are probably not doing too well because of um, the rise of COVID, uh, the interventions that are going on there and new variants. But also, I think if you look at um, September, it seems to be a bit above the line there, October below there, above there. Um, and I think really the message I give there is it would be good to see a lot more in-depth analysis, uh, model evaluation possibly for this particular publication. For both authors, I'm sure there were very strict uh, space limitations. Um, and also, since these methods and systems have been around for a while, um, as far as I can see, no one seems to have compared them directly and in detail. I love this plot from Tear Figure 2, which has already been described. It shows fantastic performance of EpiMap um, and also shows quite helpfully um, where it goes wrong sometimes around when MPIs uh, come into, into play. Um, I'm just going to move on to my last part now. Um, I know that both articles are about local RT estimation. And that's the focus of the work, but both use case counts as indicators of model quality and are asking us to judge the quality of their models on these results too. The mantra being if the case count projections look reasonable, then this is good for our model. And the thing about case counts is that they now exist. They're outcomes and we can look at them. So just picking up on one figure, Scotland from figure four of the regional estimates of case counts by tear, I want you to focus on the projections after the 10th of April. You can see the confidence interval, the 95% one kind of scoots up at the end there. And I did what the previous discussant suggested, which was using a very simple model, uh, an ARIMA model using the case count data. Uh, my predictions here are in blue. Uh, and I've got these crosses here, which are the 95% confidence into the credible intervals and the median projections for the crosses there. And then if you superimpose the data that comes out, I think we cannot rule out um, the ARIMA model for doing that particular thing. And I feel that the ARIMA model is reliable here for this particular purpose. Uh, and you might even argue that the intervals coming out from that are better than what comes out of the models in the papers. And that, my question is, what does this say about the model? Overall, though, thank you to both sets of authors for a fascinating read. Um, they're clearly genuine advances on what went before, and they're to be congratulated for producing something this impressive in this short amount of time. So I think my time's up, so thanks very much. Thank you very much, Guy, and uh, interesting time series things which uh, leads us to uh, the, our last paper this, this afternoon, which will be presenting uh, time series perspective. Um, coming back to the where we are in the meeting, so we've now had the two invited discussions and now we've had um, in advance um, um, indication that both uh, Sam Abbott and Seb Fung and also Chris Jew would like to contribute to the discussion. So I will call for Sam Abbott. Are you able to share your screen, Sam, or do you just want to speak? Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, I would like to share my screen, but I uh, appear to not have permission to do so. Uh, Luz, can you allow Sam Abbott to share his screen, please? Yes, sir, you should be able to share now. So you, you're presenting on behalf of, of yourself and, and um, Seb? On behalf of uh, yeah, myself, Sebastian Frank, and Johannes Bracker, who uh, may also be on. Um, sorry, I'm just getting a spinning wheel of nothing happening. Um, yes, well, I might just have to talk because it looks like uh, I may not be able to share screen. Um, so I will do so. Um, so first of all, uh, I just wanted to say we really enjoyed the um, work of Teatel and uh, actually all the all the papers across all of the sessions. They've been um, really, really, uh, really great. Um, however, we did have some comments, uh, which is why we, we felt it was necessary to respond. Um, <coughs> first of all, the thing that's really important to note is the comparison of the different estimators in the Teatel work is, is really fantastic to see. Uh, and I think, as other people have mentioned, it's, it's like rarely seen. Um, so that's really fantastic. Um, and we think that the lack of a, a more general systematic comparison has been like a really obvious gap in the literature, as uh, mentioned by other people. And it would be great to see that filled. Um, however, the Teatel paper does highlight some of the issues uh, around um, assessing performance uh, because it's, it's, it's really quite hard, we feel. Uh, and we think that we can break this out into three points. Um,
Sorry, I've uh, lost control of my computer going around. Uh, yes, so are you, still first trying, point, are you still trying to share or not? No. So the computer's trying to share, but it's uh, it's it's stuck in a very strange lookout loop, but it's it's uh, it's all okay. Um, so the first point is that reproduction numbers are generally not observable. So the ability of a model to um, reconstruct the trajectories can really only be assessed in a simulation study. But uh, these may not really yield sufficient information to assess the ability of a model to estimate R in the real world. Um, so while we can use simulation studies to assess, to assess the self-consistency of a model, um, what we can't really do, and, and also to avoid misspecification, it's very difficult to use that um, to assess across models, especially if the generating process is um, one of those models. Uh, and I think that is potentially a limitation of the Tertel paper. Um, and then on top of that, uh, it's very difficult to make a fair comparison between tools that each may have quite a large amount of flexibility, which I think is one of the reasons why it's not been done, um, especially when they can be parameterized in like a large uh, variety of ways. Because um, it's hard to say if the resulting performance differences are due to the methods themselves or they're due to specific user choices, which may be something uh, that's partly driven the results in the Teotel paper. Um, and then the other point we wanted to make was about uh, like a definitional issue. Like there's a core issue in defining the instantaneous reproduction number, which I think has been mentioned quite a lot and I think is you know becoming quite common knowledge. Um, so the definition is the average number of new infections caused by infected individuals at time t, weighted by their infectiousness. But this obviously leaves quite a lot of room for interpretation um, and it can be defined over numerous time frames. So we've seen weekly here being quite a common choice, but there's also obviously daily or for example, potentially monthly. So if you think about this in um, terms of a negative binomial branching process, and this is where slides would have been quite helpful, um, <laughs> what you can see is you have some uh, infections at generation t plus one drawn from a Poisson distribution around some sort of mean uh, infections at t plus one. And then those infections are generated by um, infections in the previous generation and then some scaling factor xt. And then you can model xt as a gamma distribution around the uh, like true underlying baseline R scaling factor, and then that the gamma distribution is the over dispersion. And so in that system, there are three ways to uh, define the reproduction number. You can define it as the realized reproduction number, which is IT plus one divided by IT. So that's what we might actually observe. And then there's um, the scaling factor that you would get after you've sampled from the gamma distribution. So the, the sort of random realization between generalizations, between generations of RT, and then there's a true underlying RT, which is the, which was flat over time in this model. And then on top of that, we also have sampling uncertainty, which has been mentioned. So we would actually observe uh, some sort of binomial fraction of infections, and so we'd have another definition, which would be that the, the observed infections in any given uh, window divided by the previous infections. So any assessment of the quality of RT involves some sort of inherent decision about that time scale. And about that definition and that is, is very difficult to do um but just to sort of wrap up and uh sorry about the lack of slides and, and if that was confusing but um we believe that evaluating the performance of published estimates is, is really crucial uh and the methods generating them and we we really enjoy the, the TSL approach uh but we we would stress that we think further comparisons are, are really needed and it's really key that they incorporate the opinions of those developing the methods and also those consuming them um, but ideally, it's going to be led by an independent arbiter who can sort of define the parameters of the experiment. And then lastly, I just point out, uh, it was mentioned previously that a good way to evaluate RT might be to uh, think about short term forecasting. And um, within our group, uh, we, we have been running the ECDC COVID-19 forecasting hub, which uh, allows real time submission of forecasts and evaluation of those forecasts. So we submit our own method, um, as do many other groups. And there's, there's really surprisingly interesting variation in performance uh, given different methodologies. So it's it's uh, worth looking into. But yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sam. I think evaluation and comparison is uh, it's really a collective effort, as you're pointing out. Um, I'm now going to call on Chris Jewell um, to um, to speak. Would you do you have slides, Chris, or you just want to? to talk and now uh, I've also had uh, Stephen Gilmore um, possibly contributing after after Chris. Chris Jude, are you online? Uh, 
Um, I cannot see Chris in the last list. Okay, so wh why don't we, um, P Peter, didn't you, Peter, could you just get in touch with Chris urgently? And in the meantime, we're going I'll, to... I'll, I'll do that, Sylvia. Yes, uh, and then we, we will move to Steve, uh, I'll invite then Steve Gilmore to to uh, share his comments, which he's put in the chat. Over to you, Steve, please uh, uh, mute your camera as well. Sorry, like. Steve, I think it's Stuart Gilmore, not me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Stuart. <laughs> yeah, sorry, it was Stuart. Um, nice to meet you, Stephen. It, it's the first time I've ever met someone with my surname, so um, <laughs> that's, that's fun. It's Japan here, it's Friday evening, so sorry if I'm very tired. Um, so my first question was about the word efficient in the title of the first um, the first paper, but uh, EY has already answered that and said um, that you meant that in the computational sense here. I'm amazed I can't get the sense that such a complicated program would be done efficiently, but um, okay. And the second question I had was for, um, for the second paper. I think it's the second paper. I can't tell from the the, pub, the the paper itself, but in the presentation, I think you showed the distribution of the infection ascertainment ratio, and it was the credible interval or something like that, and it was between 0.3 and 0.8, and I'm assuming that that number must be bounded below and above by 0 and 1, because it's a probability, right? Um, and that seems like a really wide interval, and I'm wondering how much um, that imprecision has been taken into account through the rest of the model because um, it seems impossible to me that you could have a 90% confidence that an RT is bigger than one when you are allowing between 30% and 80% of the of the infections to have been observed. I mean, 30% of infections is very different to 80%. So I'm wondering how, if that's been properly incorporated and, um, and what other aspects of uncertainty have been, I guess, um, included and not included in the model. And I, I think uh, Professor Gibson was asking about that as well. Uh, that's my question, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stuart. Uh, Peter, do we have, I think, uh, unless Chris Jewell is online now, we're going to run out of time. Yeah, he hasn't responded to my uh, request okay. yet. Um, okay, so I, I think something unforeseen must have come up, otherwise he's usually an instant uh, responder, even if he's not been able to log on to the meeting. Right, because he knew I would call on him, so I think, yeah. okay, so I think, uh, are there any other questions from, from the floor? Um, otherwise, I will turn to the the two presenters to give brief uh, brief answers. But uh, it, I haven't seen any um, other anything else in the chat. No. So um, I will now turn back to to Ey and Axel uh, in turn to to if they want to share some some immediate reaction to some of the comments and then of course they will have time um ah how about small ltla i see from somebody um do you mean yes small population more uncertainty Did, would you like to elaborate into in a few couple of minutes or That's great. Just... yeah this is this is this is a you sorry from public health of england you know, when we, we in the survey, you know, survey for survey statistician, when the sample size is small, of course, here I'm not sure we, do we have sample or we have just population. When you to, we, we're talking about uh, local authority with small number, it's small even maybe there is zero, you know, cases or zero sample size. How about the L, LTA, LA? Yes, the prediction is the, you know, precise or precision about that. So the question is, are you, do you feel there's a need to uh, to incorporate additional variability for very small yeah, population? There is, a, there is a big business they are calling a smaller estimation, and there are many activities, 
you know, when, when I was in Southampton University, we, we did lots of work, and there is a good book by John Rao talking about yes, the small... It's, yeah. The, yeah. This is for the specific, this is, this is for the specific... Um, yeah, so I mean, I'm not sure, you know, when you, they are interested in the local area, when the number is small, the prediction is going with too wobbly, basically the confidence is very wide, and it's an unreliable type of estimation or prediction. Over from me. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. So I will um, now turn back to turn to, to you, wife, first, uh, if you would like to make a few um summary comments okay. on the discussion yeah sure uh yeah i'd like to thank both gavin and guy and also sam as well for uh really great uh comments uh i agree with with all of them uh, i'd just like to kind of um mention one thing which is uh i think two things actually but they're related um uh i think guy brought out this interesting difference in the projections actually for RT for Flint and th that's actually one of the things that uh, why we kind of built this meta population model into our approach. If you look at Flint uh, it's actually right next to uh, where there are kind of outbreaks happening uh, in, in the um, kind of Manchester area and actually what's happening there is that the model thinks that there will be additional in influx of infections coming from the Manchester area uh, which is why the RTs are actually going up in the projection. So within the model, uh, if you just look at the prior for RT, it, um, it, it would not, ex it would not uh, project that the RTs themselves are kind of going up from the current level. Uh, but in, in, in fact, that's actually what's happening. And that's actually ha related to what we mean by RTs and this in our um, outputs of the model. Um, so within our model, we have this intrinsic RT, which describes how the epidemic grows or shrinks over time within each local authority. But we, the way we uh, uh, presented uh, our RTs is that actually we think of it not as an intrinsic property of the generative process, but rather a summary statistics of the expected number of uh, cases, uh, um, of future cases relative to the number of, oh, sorry, the expected number of secondary cases relative to the uh, to the number of primary cases, and um, and as a result, we can get this effect that you know if your local authority is close to an outbreak, and if we expect if the model thinks that there's kind of influx, it will actually increase RT as a result. Yeah, um, and this is also how we um, I was going I had a skipped slide where where I talked about how we defined regional RTs in it, uh, in this way as well. Um, I think yeah. I, Everything else, I, I completely agree. I think uh, it's one of those things where, you know, uh, there's lots of things that we could do, but for lack of uh, manpower. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Yiwai. Axel, would you like to, to take the floor? Yeah, briefly. So thanks to all of the discussions, especially the invited discussions, and they raised, you raised a number of questions. Um, I comment on some of them, and one of my co-authors, Sam Bat, would also like to say a few things. So first of all, uh, the purpose of our model was to have something that would be sustainable over time. So that's why we chose deliberately not to include MPIs, mobility, and, and so on and so forth. As you, you recall, basically, how quickly policy has changed over the last few months. It would have been a massive modeling event every time something new came along to incorporate it quickly. Um, another point that was raised, uh, about different models giving different results. As everyone probably agrees, that's probably not surprising. Uh, that's why we would probably argue and probably the way the models are being used is you should use some ensembles of models, looking at different models and see how they perform and how they compare. There was one specific point about our wide IAR and IFR estimates. What that does is it changes the underlying infections quite a bit. Think more basically that all of the infections get scaled up or down, but it doesn't really change the underlying RT or the case projections. 
that much. And Sam, over to your comment. Yeah, just, just to raise it, there, there are many different ways to, to do this modeling and things like using a filtering approach or REMA or wavelets indeed are um, a wonderful way to, to model these infections and cases and could actually perform and probably would perform better than this. The key of using the renewal equation is that it connects it to epidemiology and things we know from biology. And this is why the semi-mechanistic component of this is very difficult and is an important part of study, which is to link together statistical knowledge of functions and function classes to a mechanism that has some grounding in epidemiologic and biological reality. And this is the challenge with all of this, um, is, is to put these two worlds together, because you can do it in physics perfectly, but in epidemiology it's a lot more challenging. So I just wanted to raise that in, the, in terms of why we don't use other approaches, um, which have been brought up several times. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so I think we are actually, by magic, perfectly uh, for lunch break before we start again at two o'clock for our last session. We thank all the presenters, the discussions, the reviewers, and everybody who uh, um, has enjoyed this meeting today um for participating and um see you at two o'clock <laughs>